You're listening to The Local Maximum, episode 253. Time to expand your perspective. Welcome to The Local Maximum. Now, here's your host, Max Sklar. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You've reached another Local Maximum. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, decision science. It's all about the uh, quantitative techniques to making decisions. Well, We're not going to talk so much about that today because in most cases, that is actually not how decisions are made day to day by actual people. See, we have this, if you want to call it programming in our brains, and as it turns out, we humans have our own complex and sophisticated ways of making decisions, which could sometimes lead to good decisions and sometimes lead to decisions that are are not so good. So if you're someone who is in the Uh, quantitative field. I think this episode will give you a much more nuanced way of thinking about decisions. But for everyone else, I think the term of the day is cognitive bias. To put it positively, how can we use our brains, ourselves no less, to make better decisions rather than worse ones? That's what today's guests have been learning about and teaching about for years. We're going to be talking to a husband and wife team today, Dave and Helen Edwards. That's kind of a first on the program. They are both longtime entrepreneurs and investors, and now they've co-authored a book called Make Better Decisions. And I think the big takeaway is not some formula, some method, but some nudges, how to get your brain to do the right thing more often than it already is. The conversation starts out talking about generalities, you know, decisions as kind of an abstract situation, but wait for it. We will get into some specifics, and I hope you'll be able to uh, think about how to incorporate these lessons into your own life. And now let's welcome the program to the pro. Let's welcome to the local maximum today's guests, the authors of Make Better Decisions, Helen and Dave Edwards. You've reached the local maximum. Welcome to the show. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Yeah, it's exciting. This is the first. Uh, I think this is the first uh, duo interview that I'm doing. Uh, so this is uh, this is very exciting, uh, and um, I got a chance to uh, review uh, your book in part. Uh, you know, I've I've been trying to get through it, but the book is called "Make Better Decisions." I've got the uh, the, t- the title up here, but I'm I'm reading it on my Kindle, so that that's why. Uh, but um, I I appreciate it. It's 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 very interesting. Um, what what made you decide to write this book? Let's just start with that. We'd been working in a couple of big companies for a long time, and and, uh, I'd been increasingly intrigued by the way that people approached cognitive biases. And um, so they'd they'd sort of print them out from Wikipedia page, you know, 120-odd of them, put them on the wall next to them, and uh, think that that was going to help them be more rational thinkers. And one that just never works. And two, this whole idea of what is rational decision making uh, was it just became so intriguing to me because the more people said they needed to make a rational decision and the more that the, the data would be pre- presented to them, whether the data was clear or not clear, the more that there was this sense of, of, of almost a, um, a duel between intuition and data and a duel between rational decision-making and emotional decision-making. And so I embarked on a research project to figure out what the um, what the, the scholarly community, what the academic community was finding out about human decision-making um, with data and human decision-making um, in this context of, of us as social beings. And that's really where the book came to, is a much more of an integrated view that um, is coming out around what it takes to make good decisions that we have to, you know, we, we do think with more than just a, 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 a computational set of figures, either from data systems or from our brains. So, I, you know, the book starts out, you know, we make how many decisions a day, thousands. So what Maybe we could color this by giving us some examples of like what are some decisions that we we make day to day, or maybe some more formal decisions that we're like expected to make uh, that are that are really important, and um, how how this kind of applies. Well, you know, the very first one is the first decision that you make that's not part of your routine, <laughs> and so decisions can be like 
small. I mean, that stat in the at the start of the book is 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 all of the tiny little decisions that you make about well, you know, what should I have oat milk or or should I have cow milk or should I have no milk? You know, those kind of things in my coffee. Right. But really, what we're kind of getting at is more of these um these these bigger decisions that need to be made. They're life decisions. They could be, you know, whether to get married or whether to buy a house or you know, rent versus buy. All those sorts of things. Moving cities, career decisions, and then there's the decisions that you make at work. Um, uh, their decisions like, well, how am I going to behave in this meeting? How am I going to react to this person? Or um, sh- should we go ahead with this merger? Or what kind of um, product dis- features do we how we, how do we want to prioritize our product features? I know Dave's itching to jump in. I can no, it's <laughs> I think those kinds of decisions. Um, you know, we, they can range from like, what kind of software should we buy? Um, to run our platform on to, with things that are sort of practical, but then they can also be things that are quite strategic. Um, you know, which which um, which group do I want to go work for once I'm done in one part of my organization to another? Or um, what book do I want to buy and and read? Um, what uh, course do I want to take? Um, and you know, so a lot of this came out of the work that we were doing running workshops. We were um, running, you know, we do everything from short um, uh, presentations through to two day workshops on decision-making and we'd get to the end of them and people said, uh, can you write all that down for us? <laughs> you know, we want to be able to remember everything you just told us. This is incredible. How do we do, what do we do with this now? And that was one of the, one of the triggers for realizing that you actually had a book to write is when you spend enough time talking to somebody and say, wait, I, I want a version of that to take home with me. Um, so it was a nice sort of, you know, user pull, I think, because people want to have a reference to say, now that I'm going through my day and I'm making these decisions, what do I do with them? How do I actually put this to work? And that's what the construct in the book around using nudges. One of the okay. other aha yeah. moments that we had was that decision making isn't a process where you go through and say, step one, step two, step three, step four. It's about a practice that you have to learn and and practice over time. And so we created these concept of nudges to help people give something to them to actually practice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I noticed that in the book, like you mentioned a bunch of researchers, uh, Daniel Kahneman is is a more well-known one, I think. And, and there are others, you know, throughout, uh, like each chapter will, will tell you like which researchers talk about this certain thing. So what it sounds like you guys read, must have read a lot for this book. Uh, and it looks like it, it took quite a bit of uh, work or, or maybe that's just uh, what you've been doing for, for many years anyway. Well, it's a bit of, it's sort of both really. Um, yeah. A, an enormous amount of research um, through books and academic papers, um, talking to those academics. We've got a few of those on our, on our own podcast um, and talking to people who practice uh, mostly coaching, you know, in, in real life. Mm. And, and, um, and then the, I think the thing that um, in some ways I'm the most proud of about the book is that as Dave mentioned, this aha moment of, Oh, this isn't a process, you know, this isn't something that you can um, take a it, it, game theory is wonderful, but we just don't do it in our heads. Right. Right. <laughs> you actually right. need a, a way to sort of be nudged into practicing these ideas. Yeah. So, so what's the solution? To, is the solution to that to try to do game theory in our heads or to somehow improve what we're doing in our heads already? Yeah. Well, I think it, I mean, the, the, you've got to go to the sort of the core of our evolution, which is, you know, we are, we, we make many decisions on intuition and it's fast, efficient, and usually good enough, I think is, is how Kahneman describes it. And what we yeah. wanted to do with these nudges is to you 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 consciously practice a series of techniques and there's 50 in the book but i mean we only ever use one or two at a time and we kind of rotate them around through the weeks that's just how we use them now we encourage people in our workshops to use them so that you get you get good at at, at one or two specific things and that becomes more intuitive so yeah. for example one that um that yeah, and the the granddaddy of all is the one from Kahneman, which is delay intuition. The minute that you um, have formed a belief in something, it's very hard to unlearn or unbelieve. And so can you get in the habit of delaying intuition? Just don't leap to a conclusion. That, that takes a lot of practice. It sounds yeah. easy to say, but it takes a lot of practice. So we have other nudges that 
that support that sort of granddaddy of the nudges. And you and people are all different. You know, some of these nudges will appeal to people different. You know, will appeal to some people and and others and others not as much as as you know. It's just different. We're kind of noisy in our thinking. One that that I found massively useful. I use all the time. It's just become the way part of the way I think is calibrating my confidence, which is putting a number on my knowledge. Don't just say, don't just make an assertion, oh, I think this is going to happen. It's like, I think this is going to happen and I'm 70% sure. Right. And the right. minute you have to put a number on something, and it, it just really forces you to, because you go, well, why not 100%? Yeah. Why, why that 30% gap? Yeah. yeah. And you sort of, it, and it kicks off more um, depth in your cognition just naturally. So we the whole idea of this book is to get better at just the, the being human, just getting better at those, you know, so sort of leveraging the stuff that we just do naturally. Do you have examples of like how these techniques have helped you in making your decisions or maybe someone who has been uh, like a client or, 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 or you've been working with have, has helped them make decisions? We've got a lot. A lot. Gonna, well, yeah. I've got one from just last week. Um, I like these stories. So uh, good. Well, yeah. Work, I was working on the design for a, a software and thinking about what the user flow might be um, that we're working on a problem for a, for a, for a project for a client. And, um, and I was just sort of stumped. Couldn't quite figure it out. I couldn't decide what, what, the, what the next step would be. And so I used one of the nudges, which is called Sketch. And for creatives, this will be really um, uh, sort of obvious because you're constantly pulling out a pen and sort of drawing things. But taking that um, that nudge and applying it in other ways is really helpful. Um, we can draw out uh, a process. We could draw out someone's reaction. You could draw out just kind of whatever you feel like. Um, and I'm a terrible sketcher. Um, uh, you know, I, I would never put my sketches up anywhere for anyone to actually look at. Um, but the action of actually drawing something out is really quite helpful. And this comes from that comes from Barbara Tversky, um, one of the great minds, uh, and she's done a lot of work around um, thinking about um, both uh, creativity and design. But she wrote a wonderful book called Mind in Motion about our spatial thinking. And so one of the things you can do is you put your knowledge out in the world and you think about putting it out there by sketching. So it was a, that was a very practical use of it exactly last week. Yeah. And uh, we one we use a lot that, um, that, that we had, I think it was in the last month or so, doing some pretty heavy forecasting work with a, mm. with a uh, client. And, um, the, the, you know, you always get to this point when you're doing sort of heavy forecasting of when, when, do, you, when do you stop and, what, and what, what one do you really sort of land on? And that can yeah. often be a difficult decision because you, you're wrestling with with significant uncertainty. So there's a nudge um, called th that comes from Adam Grant, which is um, be less wrong. And so instead of trying to be be more correct and and fine tuning the things you know the most about, it's like get to a point in your forecasting where you you're, you're pretty confident, it's not bad. You know you can you, you know from experience we're about there. What else do we need to do to get over the hump of making the decision to use this one? And be less wrong is a really good one because you go through and you say, what are the things we really don't know much about? Can we take a cycle on getting better at that? And then we'll stop and lock it down. And that kind of, there's something that happens in that process where, uh, you know, the science says that, you know, it, Adam Grant's research says that you're going to get to a, that, that's going to make you more accurate. But in actual fact, something else happens as well. You get an additional benefit, which is that you get the sort of team confidence coherence. We went that extra step. We we made that one thing that we we looked where we didn't really want to go, and we we took another a, a round at that, and now we feel better. You know, we've it's almost like um, you kind of face your demons when you do that. If you if you're prepared to focus on being less wrong, and I think that just sort of gives the sense of team confidence that's hard to get any other way. So, Working with AI people, yeah. um, a, a really classic nudge. I mean, your list is one to print off and put on the wall. Comes from Jevin West at, 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 at University of Washington. Which is, who are the humans? You know, always looking for the humans in the data and never, ever, ever just abstracting yourself so much away from it that you've who lost touch humans? with what, yeah, who are the That's humans? Interesting. So that, that would be like where, I mean, 
usually it's a data set where, well, it could be a data set where humans generated the data, uh, like the ones I worked at at Foursquare, where people just writing stuff or rating stuff. Uh, but I feel like there's something a little bit more, like let's say it's temperature data of the earth. Like where, how would you answer where, where are the humans? Well, who are the humans would be more on the use side. Um, and you know, you're right. Sometimes you're, there's a few steps away. It doesn't really matter. But when it does matter, it's so high impact that mm. even just a couple of minutes taken to consider what was the point of measurement? Who looked at it and why? Sometimes right. that's important. It might not even be a direct measure of the humans. It might be who's the human who measured it and how and why did they measure it? Why were they looking at it in the first place? And I think that with, with temperature data, you could also think about is who are the humans that are going to be using the data, right? So it's one one step further, but you, there's usually some sort of action that happens. Sure, it could just be a forecast for weather, but when you're thinking about how are you applying it? Um, but we did, at, here are the humans came up um, with a large client that was dealing with uh, large transaction data, uh, sales data. And there was a major change in the sort of product mix um, uh, and there was, they were sort of looking at how to change that around to optimize more for profitability. Um, and the real push that we gave them was who are the humans in the data? And that really helped them understand who, who was driving those changes in transactions, right? It wasn't just looking at what the units were and the volumes and the locations. They're trying to understand where it was. And that then took them a couple of steps further to see who are the people and why were they making those choices? That was the key thing that it became about um, a social construct that they weren't seeing right away because you're normally looking at a Tableau dashboard that just has, you know, X and Y and what the numbers are, and you're trying to optimize for a dollar versus thinking about who the people are behind all of that. And then you're thinking about motivational change or offering something different to them, which then, right. you know, solves for everybody's, you know, best outcome. So I'm thinking about, well, I'm thinking about two things. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, sure, I've created a lot of statistical models at work and, and we make decisions off of that fine. But now I'm thinking about personal decisions. And I don't know, uh, I don't know if this reflects any cognitive bias, but I often think I, I have good decisions and I have bad decisions that I can think on. And I, I almost feel like the good decisions I've made are mostly like, processes over a long period of time. Oh, made good decisions over many years and then good things happen. Bad decisions that I can think of are things where basically I've stepped on a landmine and I should have seen it coming and I didn't. And oh my God, I, you know, that, that was a really bad decision uh, and I, I could have prevented it. So is that, is that, uh, does that uh, ring in your mind anything you've you've studied in terms of cognitive biases or, and um, is this any phenomenon that, that, that you've run into or am I just, I'm, I was just spitballing here. I, I don't think your experience is uncommon. Um, you know, given that there's, you know, 120 and increasing cognitive biases uh, and, and a list of all the cognitive, I mean, the bottom line is you could probably find a cognitive bias to explain something. But I think that what what you're really touching on is um, is that not every we can't expect to make perfect decisions all the time. So how do you think about um, personal decisions over sort of a longer period of time? And I think there's a couple of different ways to think about it. A lot of the personal decisions are pretty gnarly. They're pretty, they, you know, some of these things are, um, you can never fully imagine the future and you can never fully imagine how you're going to feel in the future. There's such a strong um, bias towards um, it, 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 that, that sort of near-term bias. We understand, we discount the future. So there's a cognitive bias around that. Things that are near term are more real to us. Um, we don't we don't bind as much. We don't we don't care as much about things in the future. There's a lot of academic study around discounting, um, mm. and and that that is that's a well known effect. And another another aspect of that is we we also have well known biases about we, how we forecast our emotions in the future. So we think that. Um, we un we underestimate how adaptable we are. Bad things that are going to happen, we think they're going to be worse than they actually are. We adapt. Good things that are going to happen, we actually get we, they're never as good, or or we adapt to them. The hedonistic um, bias, we just sort of get used to things yeah. that are good and want more. 
Yeah, there, I, I think that one of the more important nudges in, in this area that you're talking about is engaging your metacognition. And uh, metacognition is, is, our, is a uh, unique human capability of being able to think about how we think. So engaging your metacognition might help you understand why don't why are you why do you regret the decision that you made? What do you think your error was, and how might you improve it? Do you need to? Um, were you overly confident? Do you need to actually calibrate your confidence? Were you using your intuition uh, in a way in an area where your intuition is just isn't very strong? You know, um, or it's just completely unreliable. It's just completely unreliable. Were you yeah. in the wrong emotional state? Were you too low emotional, or were you too high in terms of emotional balance? And do you need to actually find that emotional sweet spot to be able to make that decision? Mm -hmm. And it can be the, the frustrating part is we can make bad decisions all the time, and you can feel like you're playing whack a mole. Right, where you just oh god, it, that was that was the bad one, and that was the bad one, and chasing it. Yeah. And I think our our point is more. It's, it's frustrating when you feel theme. like you make the same one twice. And and you're yeah, like, and if you can find a, but if you can find a theme, then and you can yeah. say, geez, you know, I just didn't. I, I really needed to get. I uh, I really needed to. One of our nudges is get the outside view. Mm. You know, I was looking at this problem, and I thought I knew the answer, but I looking back on it, I really needed to go get the outside view by talking to other people or doing other research and getting other perspectives. So that's going to be my nudge that I'm going to focus on for some period of time. Every time I get the chance, I'm going to try to take the outside view, and I'm going to practice that. I'm going to make that part of how I make decisions, and that hopefully just helps you make better decisions. Mm. Right? That's a key part of the t the title of the book is better decisions. We're not saying perfect decisions. That's an unrealistic goal. Just right. slightly no, better is good. Slightly optimal. better. And yeah. And, yeah. and it, when you say optimal, I think part of it is um, there's this idea out there that that maybe it's, I think it came from Jeff Bezos, but it, it's um, optimizing regret rather than minimizing regret. You know, we, yeah. I think there's this cultural overlay that, that we're supposed to live life without regret. Um, I always think a, fun, a fabulous data point is that the number one tattoo that gets removed in the U.S. every year is the one that says no regrets, <laughs> and um, it, it's just so it's just such wonderful irony. And this, in writing this book, I actually dove really deep into into a lot of research on regret. And there's there's been um, some great stuff recently come out from Daniel Pink did did um, a lot of work on it, and it's embracing the fact that. It's unrealistic to think that you're not going to have regrets. If you if you're not having regrets, you're either completely dishonest and have no metacognition, or you're um you're not taking enough risk. You're not taking enough chances in your life. And the um this the, so what I've done myself with with regret is be much more um, re reflective and look for patterns that are problematic. Like, am I consistently mm -hmm. over or underconfident? And really understanding that, or um, do I do I make the same? Am I, am I making the same sort of decision that's incorrect in the same class of decisions? And that sounds complicated. And I'll explain what I mean with a with a really simple example, which is: Am I feeling bad about what I eat because I always eat potato chips? You know, I break down and eat potato chips. So I could have this decision that says I'm never eating potato chips again and I'm never going to stick to that. I just know that up front. Or do I do I make sure that I don't have potato chips easily available and allow myself the time to eat potato chips when when they are available? It's that kind of simple reframing of this class of decisions and and sort of making a making small decisions, seeing how small decisions add up to being big ones. It and sounds being, like you can adjust your environment to almost uh, encourage yourself to make better decisions later on. Well, in that case, yeah, you can. It's a, it's called pre-commitment where you basically don't have potato chips in the house, right? right. You make the decision. You make it hard for yourself. So yeah. creating that so I barrier. Know, I know if I buy that big uh, that, that big thing of potato chips, it's it's gone in a few days. And I'm like, oh, my God, I ate it. And yeah. Uh, yeah. it doesn't feel <laughs> yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we I know that say, problem. Uh, Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a, um, a a nudge that I that I like a lot um, called plug the leaks, which actually comes from poker playing, and it's that poker players recognize that big mistakes happen when you let go of the little things, and mm. and they're very very disciplined about um, making sure that every decision in, is in service to the greatest expected value, and that's a very algorithmic way of looking at life and not 
every class of decisions needs to fall into that. Like I can't do potato chips in a plug the leaks way, but I can do um, uh, basic like digital hygiene in a plug the leaks way. Like yeah. don't just dive in and out of Twitter randomly. You know, it's, it's, I'm very oh, careful to be like really specific on that one. I, I have that specific problem. I, I don't know how to, because Twitter is everywhere. Even when I take it off my phone, it's still on the computer when I'm trying to work. And when I'm, you know, following some news story or something, I have a hard time getting off it. I, I don't know. I haven't had a, uh, I haven't had a good solution to it yet other than <laughs> extra software. That is a tough that, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, yeah, and so, some stuff is just straight, yeah. like there is some hardcore you kind of have to like yeah. force yourself. It's just, yeah. it's just total, like, you know, being, yeah, yeah just being focused on, on sticking to, plugging the leaks. Right, right. So I, you know, I, I feel like we're usually told that uh, feeling regret is a bad thing. Wallowing in your problems is a bad thing. And it does seem like, you know, I don't want to do that. That seems unpleasant. You certainly don't want to do it for too long, but you seem to take a different approach here than like never do that. And is that right? And how do you, where do you draw the line? Well, I think that all of these things come with a degree of nuance. And and one of the things that's happened, I think, in the in the data-driven age is we're looking for such simple answers all the time. And sometimes they just don't exist. And I think this whole issue of regret is is a really classic example of we're, t- we're so told, you know, no regrets and, and don't ruminate. No, don't ruminate. Ruminating is bad. There's no question. Going too far is bad. But this idea, reframing that as um, the right amount of metacognition is a perfect example of, of, of getting the balance set better you know thinking about this as thinking about your thinking and being um quite objective trying to stay objective about it is different than ruminating and beating yourself up so mm. instead of sitting there saying oh gosh shouldn't have done that take it to it take it to take it out of rumination and put it into metacognition put it into i'm thinking about my thinking and i'm going to mm. come out of, with a new strategy on this yeah you mentioned walla walla was one of our favorite nudges it comes from our friend michael bungay stanier um and that's specifically around uh to counterbalance our desire to come up with a solution it feels so good to be the one who solved the problem you know it feels good internally we've actually you know evolved to have that good feeling to to have that um, solution but it also feels quite good in a in a group right you know well what are we going to do about this Ooh, i have the answer and so you what you really want to do though in order to make a good decision is to push back against that desire and to wallow in the problem to really understand it and this comes from michael's view as a designer right so this is the idea that you if you spend 10 times more in the problem than you do in creating the solution you know, that sort of concept that to truly understand the problem, you have to wallow in it. You have to pre- prevent yourself from trying to create solutions because then you'll get attached to that solution because it feels so good. And frequently that leads you to a non-optimal decision. So if you can hold back and really think about it, wallow in it, enjoy that prob- that that problem stage, you're probably in a much better choice to sort of make a dis- the right decision. Right, right. So- uh, y- you kind of, uh, the subtitle of your book mentions the digital age. And I think a lot of what you're talking about applies to decision-making in any age. But uh, do you think that decision-making has become harder with access to more data? Yes, yeah. very much so. It, yeah. Part of it is that I think you know, I there's, this sort of, <laughs> there's sort of a premise, there's a premise that um, the answer is just in the data. You know, if we just look at it, there'll be the answer. And so we've sort of set it up. Some of what one of the reasons it makes it harder is that we have higher expectations. We think that the answer is there. And because we have all of this great data and there's all of these numbers and facts and letters and all of these other things aggregated in a data lake, then it should be easier to make a decision, right? But it actually isn't because we're creating this this quantity of information that we haven't evolved as humans to be able to process. We've also created a world of data where we actually can't interrogate it. The only way to, the only thing that can actually and understand the data is the machine itself. So we've created all of these barriers. It's immense opportunity, right? To have all of this data, to be able to apply algorithms to it, to have predictions using this, you know, hugely multidimensional data. Um, But we have only been experiencing this for a 
couple, you know, a few decades at most, and in some cases, it's only been a few years. We as a human species haven't evolved to actually do well with that. Yeah, we uh, like stories, not statistics. Yeah, and mm. and um, although we cognitively c- can grasp it, um, what happens is we we get stuck on the action side of it, mm. and it, it doesn't the, the the statistics doesn't help us. Um, it doesn't help us act. We need the story to um, to provide the the emotions for the for for getting out and actually acting and and making that happen in the world. And I think too that there's um, there's a couple of different ways to slice this one. It's a hard one to prove. You know, we tried to sort of figure out if we could prove it, but you can't really prove it. What you can do though is draw some pretty reasonable inferences from lots of different places. One place is that um, we we do know that we get our knowledge from our community. And this is well um, documented in the psychological psychology li- literature that we have the sense of of feeling we know something right. because we have access to a community that knows it. So we feel we know more than we do. And when that community is um, data and AI, like it's Google, um, we also ha- the same thing happens. We have the sense that we know more than we do, and then I think that we always feel like we need that cognitive crutch, and we have to. We can't make a decision until we've gone to, uh, because we you know we know it's there, so we need to go get it every time, and we see that in um, we see that in people using large data sets that are in real time. Uh, that one of the problems has become people have. A lot of people have lost the 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 ability to make a decision um, if they see a disconnect between real time data and data that's just like daily or hourly. It's like they've it's like they've least lost the ability to sort of fill in the gap there. And and some of that is just confidence. It's like well well if I have access to real time data, surely that should be better. I'll wait until I can you know pick up my phone again. So it's kind of strange what's happening, and there's not a not a um, it's not a not an easy one to prove, but I think you can come up with a lot of different ways to explain why people feel like decision making's got more difficult. It's also we don't even know exactly what a machine can do with a data set. Like let's say I, I have, like you said, multi dimensional data. I'm running some machine learning model through it. Maybe it's a maybe it's a deep learning model, maybe or maybe it's you know uh, a, a random forest decision tree or something. Where like, okay, I don't know exactly what it's going to be able to do with this. I don't know if it's going to be able to find some weird interaction of terms and and uh, and and pick out the answer. And so there's almost a you know uh, I, I feel like there there's a there, there, there could be a problem with thinking there's like a genie in the machine when there really isn't. Yeah, well, you're touching on the black box problem, but I think it goes further. The way you described it, the sort of almost the, the emotion in your voice mm. is um, it, that it comes down to the fact that humans are causal reasoners. You know, we 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 so wired for looking for cause. It's very hard to stay in a world of correlation very hard to look at that the outcome of the machine learning model and the answer is 42 and you don't know whether 42 is is an astonishingly unusual only the machine uh, go beat lee sort of answer um or whether it's just completely a statistical outlier there's no use to you at all and even if it is something that you can see as predictable and accurate and something you can act on it's it's harder to make a decision to act on it because you don't know why the answer is 42. In some of these cases, you were not seeing the cause and effect because we don't understand what the algorithm is actually doing. We can't understand the data. And so that does make it harder to decide to follow the recommendation because we don't know it. Right. Now, what's interesting is it's there's, easier for us there's to, a flip to rely side to on that, a person. Though. I, I feel mm-hmm. like there's a flip side. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, uh, you know, maybe I'm talking past you at a different thing. But like, you know, when I was ranking venues at Foursquare restaurants to eat, I feel like when people were using the app, and and other people have have uh, told me this as well. People who work on like uh, video recommendations or whatever, people ascribe an intelligence to the ranker that it does not have. You know, like mm-hmm. people think it's that's uh, that causal thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They they think oh it knows me so well you know and it's just no we just did very something very simple. 
<laughs> well, we, it's it's almost well. It, it, this is anthropomorphism. Yeah, and it's um it's a it's a delicate line because some degree of it is actually incredibly helpful to a designer, um, because right. it it helps define a mental model and it helps bound a certain um you know set of of attributes in the way that you might interact with a piece of technology um so but it, it, there's real skill in understanding just how much anthropomorphism you want to put in that mental model just how much do you want someone to think oh they really do know me yeah yeah. So I, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. I was saying sometimes people ascribe too much intelligence to the machine. You were saying, though, sometimes it, it's people don't know what to make of it. So maybe we can get back to that as well. Yeah. I think, well, uh, this sort of the, the, the challenge that we've seen is that people can look at the, you know, the prediction that comes out of a model. And if they don't understand why that prediction exists, it can be hard to feel confident making a decision. And there's a couple different outcomes. People can just go, oh, I don't really understand that. So I'm going to go with what I think. I'm just going to sort of follow my intuition or some sort of historical pattern yeah. that I built in my life, et cetera. Or uh, I'm just not going to be as confident, you know, in that outcome because I don't understand it. Um, and what's in some ways um, intriguing is that they can have a, they can have a very different reaction when it's a person walking in. When it's the VP of sales coming in saying, I really believe this is what we're going to make next year. You know, and you look the person in the eye and you've got this because we've, we've, we, we have evolved to, you know, trust each other. And to a certain extent, when we feel like we're part of the same tribe, when we feel like we've got common experiences, when we feel like we've got, you know, we, we understand how to gauge someone else's confidence. And so we go, great, we're going to do this together, but we don't have that ability to do that with a machine. And so even though there may be higher accuracy or the confidence may be higher in the machine, we still don't really understand why that's happening and we can't interrogate it. We can't ask them, why do you think that? Well, and the flip side is automation bias. True. And um, and just taking what the machine says, even though, you know, there's, the there's evidence. No. Yeah, the evidence to the yeah. contrary. And I mean, this is a, the automation bias is just such an interesting field and there is a lot of research going on, um, particularly, I mean, I mean the, obvious, the obvious place to, 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 to look as self-driving cars mm -hmm. and and to be able to, to to look at driverless cars or some variation of 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 driving autonomy and try and unpick well what's really happening in this system and and what's the right way to think about designing a system where um because for a full driverless car to work you actually have to take the human out forever because you can't have a situation where a human is only required 0.01% of the time to do something that's highly skilled right, and requires no. a handover within like microseconds. You know, I want to get just, in, fall asleep, it's an, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or, or look we at actually, several, several yeah. years ago, we actually did a consumer survey with, yeah. about what people would want to do when the car was driving itself. Right. Uh, and sleeping was definitely one of them. Oh, yeah, uh, was one of the great. high was one of the high ranking ones. I can like go to sleep and wake up in like Florida or something. I don't know, uh, but uh, that would actually be a little longer. Uh, but um, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of places that go overnight. Um, are, are in terms of the automation bias or, or the reverse of that? You, I, I, I'm almost imagining someone who. Um, and I'm trying to think if this has happened to me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has, but I feel like I've heard more stories about it where someone made the wrong d decision and they were like, ah, the, the, my model told me what was going to happen. And it was all set up and we set it up beforehand to predict this. And I just didn't believe it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just, and we have a nudge for that, which is, yeah. uh, we have a nudge for that, which is ambiguous data. Yeah. And um, the, it, it, the, the more that you, that you need to believe what the model says, the more that for it to actually, you know, really impact your decision making, the more it has to resolve ambiguous data. You're so sensitive. We're so sensitive to ambiguity that if the data is ambiguous, we will literally go to our intuition. Mm. So I think it's an it's an interesting thing to think through. And and a lot of this does come back to how machine learning um has is forcing us to sort of, those of us who are involved in it, to really um, think differently about uncertainty, to think yeah. differently about um, probabilistic predictions, probabilistic um, outcomes in our own lives. You know, the, the the revolution in my mind that's happened in the last decade is is just more naturally thinking probabilistically. 
Right, and right. constantly sort of weighing up what uncertainty means in this situation. And I think that that's a, one of the big challenges for people that are building and using ML models that other people who uh, aren't trained in, the, in anything statistical need to really um, come to terms with is how do you design and how do you present and how do you communicate uncertainty in the machine and in the human? Because they have to kind of come together to uh, in a way that makes sense to the person who has to do something. So you don't want to amplify uncertainty. You don't want to have uncertainty be uh, washed away in poor visualizations or presented in a in a, in a non meaningful way. You should, this is a frontier of research, and a lot of research has been done. In, I think Northwestern University on on this is how do you how do you get people to make better decisions when we don't like uncertainty. But we're being presented with um, quantitative um, measures of uncertainty in ways that we've never experienced before. There's just so much more um, presentation of of uncertainty all the time. I think this is a big gap that's important for ML engineers really to to be constantly aware of. Is if people have been using computers for a long time, and I've been using a personal computer for forty years, we're used to them being binary systems. They're on, they're off. It's a one, it's a zero. Like we're used to that that function. The, the form was submitted or there's an error, those kinds of outcomes. Now we're creating so many systems where there is a probability and there is an expected error rate because that's the way the systems work. There will be an error. So how do we how do we design those systems to be able to make sure that the person that's using them starts to understand that, which is difficult because we don't naturally think probabilistically. That's mm-hmm. not the way we are. You know, we're, we're not, we, we don't naturally think in statistics. It, it's actually a really sort of uncomfortable way to think. And it all depends on the framing, right? We talk a lot about how we, you know, things like, well, it's uh, 95% fat free or it's 5% fat. Which one of those numbers, you know, is the way that frames the, you know, frames the question in a way, or, or the the premise in the way that that gets the the expected outcome? If you had to give uh, the average person one nudge to take away uh, that would help their decision making immediately uh, for people listening, not necessarily ML engineers, just general person listening to the podcast, uh, who, what, what nudge would you pick? Well, it's pretty hard to go past I know. intuition, mm. um, but we have All talked right. a lot about that. Uh, oh, well, let me think. The the because because see, the, one of the things about us humans uh, is we're very noisy in our thinking. So you could have asked me this an, an hour before, and I'll give you a different. Well, I'll give you the one that's yeah. on the top of my mind today, which is um, rewild your attention. It comes oh, from it's Clive Thompson, and it I love uh, that what is it? because Re- rewild your attention. Rewild. And, um, Rewild. It's rewilding is his like rewild your yard. Yeah. Don't don't mow the lawn. So the the premise here is that you know living in a algorithmic world where our experience is like um, very finely you know crafted rows of corn, you know sort of uh, large scale agricultural. Whereas he says that you know the best place for our mind and the way that we've evolved and that makes us, you know, best in terms of imaginative and creative thinkers is to be in, you know, a lush forest that's covered in moss and, and mushrooms and, you know, crazy animals running around. And so the question is, how do you break free of the algorithmically designed information that is in front of you and allow your imagination to, to rewild? It's and I so I spend time doing that. I find myself getting stuck in a rut, literally like a rut, like it's where the the harvester came through, you know. And I really want to be able to stop and just think about things differently before I make this decision. And so, you know, we pick up random books on the shelf, or you stop and you we we like wandering down to the local bookstore, wandering, yeah. and you find something new that you've never found. Or yeah. while you're doing something, try to go look for something online in a way that's not the way you normally would. Don't go to Google, go bounce around to something yeah. else, follow Definitely a random link Twitter. at the bottom, yeah. you know, following your imagination. I love I'll that. Give, I'll give you one for, that I think is actually really, really useful for young professionals who are just uh, starting out, um, say, managing teams. And that's explain, teach, pitch. Yeah. 
And it's just, I wish I'd had this in my twenties. That this it, explanations are generative. You know, think of think of the way that you know GANs work by competing with each other. If you can explain something, you really do understand it. And one of the reasons is because you generate new models in your head while you do the explanation, and so do other people. So getting people to explain something is an incredibly powerful way of building knowledge and helping. Um, you you know explain yourself is the same thing. Teaching goes up a step. You've got to meet someone where they are. You've got to understand the state of their knowledge. So if you can teach someone, if they can teach you, that next layer of knowledge is built in. And then pitch is another level again, because pitch, you have to actually get someone to act. You've got to influence them and persuade them to be on your side and to, and to, to see your way of or you see your your view of the world. So I think explain, teach, pitch for young professionals and young team leaders is such a useful way of thinking about getting um, better knowledge coherence in their team. So you know, you add to your add to your half hour stand up meetings and explain, t- teach, pitch moment. You know, um, mm-hmm. we're going to do a bit of a get someone to pitch their latest idea. Just practice that, or get two people to teach each other, or just an sheer explanation of something complex. All right. Yeah, that's a that's a good thing to think about. Uh it's a good thing to take away. Uh you guys you guys have uh we're, we're almost uh up with time, but you guys have uh, a, a podcast yourselves, is that correct? The artificiality podcast. I mean tell tell us about that. Yes, artificiality's been around for a bit of while. We tend to uh interview um authors uh, in same kind of areas that we're in. So we're thinking about sort of, we describe it as the human machine community. Um, we interview some practitioners here and there, and we're, we're doing more of, uh, discussing, discussing topics and interviewing each other. So it's actually a podcast that you're catching us in a moment of, of, uh, evolution, it will. Um, and that we'll be uh, having more of us talking about, you know, sort of topics of the day and how to think about using these nudges in ways to be able to um, sort of, evaluate yeah, potentially live, better decision making. Live decision making. <laughs> live decision making. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you look around look around the news, there's a lot of people making what uh, we think are kind of dumb decisions. So maybe there's some ways to apply nudges that might be helpful to them. So. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check out the podcast, uh, especially the long trip I have coming up. Uh, you know, I do have a lot of podcasts, but uh, but I, I definitely want to look at it because Great. this stuff I feel like is really uh, is really useful and it's really interesting. Like anything that's um, anything that's like uh, when you talk about your own psychology is is inherently interesting. I think, um, mm-hmm. especially as a, as a data person. All right. So the book is called "Make Better Decisions." Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, Helen and Dave. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, why don't you tell us any last thoughts you have about our discussion today and where to find you guys and the book online? Oh, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we do love um, uh, working with technical audiences, which I think is that uh, lines up well with yours. That's actually, yeah. we do quite a lot of work with technology organizations, data people, analysts. Um, part of it is applying decision-making skills And we do a lot of work with them also to help them figure out how to describe AI and data science to all the people in the organization that don't really understand it, but need to understand it. So we're helping them figure out that translation mechanism. Um, In terms of where to find us, our business, Sonder Studio, you can find us on getsonder.com. That's where you learn about who we are, our workshops, the work we do with different companies in the world of research, education, design. You can find artificiality on your podcast um, platform. We also we host and publish it on Substack, so that's artificiality.substack.com, and uh, you can kind of find us on social media wherever you feel like it. Reach out to us on LinkedIn. We'd love making new connections and getting to know people. Yeah, and I I just add that you know this is all this is this is this is real passion stuff for us, and um, we've been really fortunate to be able to create a business out of it. Um, it, when we first started, it was like so niche. You know, anyone who wants to talk about relationship between machines and humans, what? So, you know, we do understand that, you know, humans are being digitized. That's what's happening. We're becoming data and we are on a mission to just make that better. All right. It's fascinating. Thank you very much, Helen and Dave. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That was a lot of fun. Maybe we can talk on the locals more, maximum.locals.com. What are some good and bad decisions that you've made? What's the best decision you've ever made? 
I would ask, what's the worst decision you ever made? But if you know what that is, you might not want to share it. Uh, I think I'm going to give a list of examples for subscribers to the locals. That's maximum.locals.com. But this stuff, you know, is very sensitive, very personal stuff. So if you're not a subscriber, I don't think I'm, I'm going to give you access. Usually I give everyone access to my things, but, n but not that. All right. So next week, next week is Thanksgiving. I'm going to try to fit a, uh, a solo show in. Not sure if we're going to do news or concept yet. Uh, I, I know we cover Twitter a lot, but there is always more Twitter. Uh, but the concept, you know, because I, I'm going back into some of my old papers more, uh, I, I feel the concept pull as well. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. And hopefully... We will start off December with another news update with Aaron. Maybe you can come live here into the studio. Have a great week, everyone. That's the show. To support The Local Maximum, sign up for exclusive content and our online community at Maximum.Locals.com. The Local Maximum is available wherever podcasts are found. If you want to keep up, remember to subscribe on your podcast app. Also, check out the website with show notes and additional materials at localmaxradio.com. If you want to contact me, the host, send an email to localmaxradio at gmail.com. Have a great week. Feel the power.